Hello and welcome to another session of NIV. Um, we're very excited to have everyone joining us. And I see there's some people that have stayed up quite late as well, so that's exciting. Um, if you could just give an indication in the comments that you can hear me. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with the um, introduction. My name is Siobhan um, and Julianne is my co-host. Um, Darby's also part of NIV. Um, he might show up in the comments tonight. Uh, so the NIV is the Neural Engineering Research Venture. Um, our aim is to bring neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. Uh, before we get going, we'd just like to start with a few announcements, um, some opportunities that you might be excited to hear about. Um, the Neuromatch Academy that recently took place, um, all their resources are available online um, and definitely worth checking out. It's three weeks worth of tutorials. Um, if you would like to do an in-person summer school, there is one happening at the DTU Compute in Denmark. Um, it will be online as well, um, but please get an email in as soon as possible um, since the deadline has technically passed, but you are able to, to um, get a late entry in. Then um, I'd just like to highlight um, some cool podcasts that you can add to your repertoire. The first one is uh, the Artificial Intelligence Podcast which is a series of conversations about technology, science, and the human condition hosted by Lex Friedman. Another great podcast is DeepMind, the podcast, which is hosted by Hannah Fry and answers all questions, everything related to AI, what it is, um, how can you get involved, and um, yeah, really worth checking out. Uh, just a few house rules. Um, please remember that we're all from all corners of the earth, uh, so please use respectful and inclusive language um, when commenting. Uh, we do um, encourage you to engage during the talk. Uh, please use the ask a question feature at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, this is where you can post all your questions and then also please vote for your favorites. Um, the most popular questions are more likely to be asked first. And um, while we do encourage you to come online and ask them yourselves, if you don't have a mic, that's not a problem. Uh, we will happily ask on your behalf. Please just indicate that in the question. If your connection is slow, the best thing to do is to try refresh the browser. Um, it really does help. Alternatively, um, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there is an option to adjust the screen quality. Um, lowering the sweet stream quality might help with the um, online experience. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Julianne to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone. I am very excited this evening to introduce our speaker. Dr. Grace Leslie is an assistant professor at the School of Music at Georgia Tech, where she directs the Brain Music Lab at the Center for Music Technology. She completed a PhD in music and cognitive science at the University of California in San Diego. And here she was doing research with Scott McCaig at the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience. Dr. Leslie was recently a fellow at the Neocom Institute for Interdisciplinary Computation at Dartmouth University, and also a post postdoctoral fellow in Rosalind Picard's Effective Computing Group at the MIT Media Lab. Her research uses scientific analysis of EEG, ECOG, and other physiological data to understand effective responses to music engagement. Additionally, she uses these experimental methods to engineer new musical interventions for health and well-being, including the development of musical brain computer interfaces. And with that, I will now hand over to Dr. Grace Leslie. Thank you, Julianne. Um, thank you, Siobhan. This is quite an honor to be joining everybody um, here today, as you said, from all corners of the world. So this is a really special experience. I think one very well suited to our times. I hope everybody is doing well and, and safe right now. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you today about uh, the research that I do in the Brain Music Lab at Georgia Tech um, with all of my graduate students. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how this vein of research uh, came to be. Um, and kind of describing what are the, the creative and musical impulses um, that inspire the research themes that we're looking at um, and uh, vice versa. What are the, the kinds of um, new research that we find um, 
from our community that we then uh, search for artistic outlets to communicate um, this kind of new knowledge. So with that, I'm going to show some slides. Okay, can you all see my slide? Okay, yes. Um, perfect. And I'm going to make one more change to the sound. All right, and you can all still hear me as well. I'm hoping. Yep, okay. Um, so, um, you know, like I said, uh, I am uh, speaking uh, to you from the Brain Music Lab at Georgia Tech. Um, we have, uh, uh, I currently have 13 students. We have two PhD students, uh, six uh, master's students as well. Um, and we're setting up this whole research uh, infrastructure um, to do all kinds of uh, experiments looking at how the brain and the body uh, respond um, to music uh, engagement. Um, and so um, we use all different kinds of sensors, um, most commonly research grade uh, EEG, um, but also consumer uh, based uh, uh, wearable technology as well. Um, the goal there um, being to produce uh, technology that is going to be accessible um, for artists to be able to use in their practice um, and also for uh, younger students uh, to be able to learn the scientific method um, by experimenting with this kind of brain music concept. Um, so. I'll be talking to you today about my work as a composer and a music technologist, um, and mostly in terms of how I'm creating musical systems that respond to the body and to the brain. Um, but I want to stress that, that this idea is not really new. Uh, it's only in the last 50 years or so that we've been able to really apply quantitative uh, um, methods and thought to this process. So actually, composers um, and performers have been thinking for quite some time about there being this unknowable and internal well of uh, music that is inside of us, that if only we had the right kind of instrument, um, whether that is a traditional kind of music instrument or a new kind of technology, that it'll be able to unleash this kind of uh, inner music that we have inside of this, um, inside of us. So uh, one of the really influential experimental music composers of the early 20th century, Edgar Varez. I believe that he had this kind of concept in mind when he wrote that I dream of instruments obedient to my thought and with which their contribution of a whole new world of unsuspected sounds will lend themselves to the exigencies of my inner rhythm. So now, uh, almost 100 years later, I'm taking very literally uh, Perez's dream of, of instruments that are obedient to thought by incorporating physiological measurement of my cognitive and, and affective state uh, into my performance practice as a flutist and also an uh, electronic musician.
real time as I'm performing um, based on algorithms that I design uh, custom for this uh, performance practice. And um, there's really a set of musical compositions that uh, emerged from this practice where um, I really uh, chose So um, uh, the music, the, the music, uh, uh, you know, then evolved to kind of match what the affordances were of this particular um, uh, system. Uh, and so the music and the performance, as you can kind of see in this video, turned into something that was um, very quiet and introspective. Uh, as a result of needing to find a particular mindset on stage to be able to uh, um, uh, change the um, uh, the actual data and uh, parameters while on stage. So uh, each of the um, performances that you can see here are really the the results of an n equals one experiment. You could kind of think about it that way. Um, in this case, it's really how how um, the breathing techniques that flutists like me are trained to do um, really allow us to perform with other parts of our bodies as well. So uh, in the piece that you heard, um, I'm constantly doing circular breathing. Um, which is kind of a technique that allows me to output um, my breath uh, simultaneously as I am uh, breathing in. Um, and as you can probably uh, imagine, uh, just by learning how to do that kind of really tight breath control, um, there's kind of this cascade of effects that will happen in the body that my sensors then pick up. Um, most commonly, it you know you can kind of see this progression in how the heart rhythms change over the course of 20 minutes of a performance like this. Um, so this is uh, a screenshot of uh, the Bandcamp uh, page where I uh, post uh, these kinds of performances and you can stream them um, free on this page. So uh, in parallel with this performance uh, practice, uh, I've pursued a path of research uh, with colleagues first at the University of California at San Diego, um, and then MIT and Dartmouth and now Georgia Tech that uses um, methods from science and engineering to sense the ambient electrical activity and properties that are uh, released by the body uh, during uh, these kinds of musical engagement. Uh, or biosignals. Um, and the signals that I look at include electrodermal activity, heartbeat, breathing information, um, muscle activity, but most often EEG. Um, and over this 10 year period, I've really been uh, captivated um, by the shared mathematical properties of brain and body signals, along with uh, a musical sound. Um, and uh, in particular, the ways that we can process and analyze these kinds of signals together. Um, so consequently, I've created a program of research and creative practice, which is really centered around this kind of concept um, that we can kind of work with these two sets of time series data uh, in parallel and kind of see what, what each will reveal about the other. Um, so just as an example here, um, maybe we can try um, some of our audience interaction. Um, I'm just kind of curious about um, what you notice in these two spectrograms that you can see here. Um, and you can probably tell from the labels which is which, but one of these is a music um, sample and the other one is a uh, EEG uh, data sample. Um, and I'm curious if anybody um, might be able to type something in the chat window about um, anything that you might see in common um, between these two sets of data. Um, are there any kind of physical properties um, that you see inherent um, in these two sets of, uh, 
of voltages that we are um, plotting here. And I'm actually currently trying to think of something that I can say as well, because this is the first time that I'm asking this question. But I think I got something. Interval and intensity. Right, so we can kind of see um, that, you know, just by the the change in the intensity um, parameter of that plot, we can kind of see that there are um, these uh, variations happening over time. Um, to use a, a musical term, we could say that each of these has a certain kind of uh, rhythm and tempo, let's say. Um, in the music sample on the left, um, you know, you can kind of, uh, you would be able to extract the tempo of this particular sample just by looking at those kind of um, vertical uh, um, striations in that pattern. And on the right, you know, you can see that um, since this is the output from an experiment of somebody opening and closing their eyes, you can see that there's this kind of rhythmic um, uh, transition in alpha activity um, based on when somebody is opening their eyes or closing their eyes here as well. I, I thought of one more thing as well, um, maybe in one of the other dimensions, um, maybe somebody else has an idea of what I'm thinking of. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Yeah, exactly. Horizontal lines that emerge. So you see, uh, Michael says that there are 10 narrow horizontal um, lines on the right and mostly a thick and thin line on the left. Um, so those horizontal lines uh, in the music community, they are what we would call harmonics. Um, you can see in any kind of sound that you would um, record from nature, from a violin, from a bird, singing in the forest, um, you're going to see some kind of um, fundamental uh, um, musical tone, which is the one that uh, perceptually we are going to attribute to that sound. Um, but then because of um, the nature of how that sound propagates, how that sound uh, um, will uh, be created within a particular enclosure that is going to emphasize certain modes in that sound, you're going to see those those uh, harmonics existing uh, as well. Um, and in nature, those are going to be at integer multiples. Um, interestingly, we can see that on the right as well. We can actually see um, that um, that alpha uh, activity in those uh, red um, uh, smudges that you see there. But uh, as well, you see um, a harmonic of that activity, um, right where it says eyes open uh, for the first time there. Um, so you can see that kind of um, slightly smaller red smudge there uh, as well. So these are just kind of two very broad um, examples of um, how we can kind of look at this data um, and analyze it in um, similar ways. So now I'm going to show you um, some more specific examples um, of how when we're looking at this kind of whole um, uh, feedback loop, um, you know, we can kind of uh, imagine how we can take um, a real time stream of this kind of data, um, make some kind of uh, measurements or observations of that. Um, so that's uh, where you see this kind of live um, plot there in the corner. Um, you know, we can, one thing that we very commonly do is um, make real-time observations um, about the data or inferences about what that person might be experiencing from the data that we're looking at. So for instance, um, what is the probability that they're experiencing a state of high focus um, based on the EEG pattern that we're noticing here? Um, my research is also um, very much focused on taking that information about those inferences and then turning those back into um, music and, uh, and um, visual output uh, so that we can um, try to express in some way what that person's internal state is. Um, and then I like to kind of close this um, 
uh, feedback loop that you see here uh, in that when that person in turn is hearing that sound output, they are actually getting a live uh, you know, input um, of what they are experiencing inside, um, maybe things that they are not actually uh, aware of. Um, and through the process of biofeedback, um, we can actually influence them to change uh, the particular state that they are experiencing at that time. Um, so for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to kind of show you examples of different projects that I've done that um, kind of exist on different parts of this uh, um, feedback loop that you're seeing here. Do we have any questions actually so far before I embark on some of these really specific things? Okay, I'm going to keep going, but please feel free um, to post um, questions as you have them. Um, so just one quick example of this part of that um, feedback loop. Um, you can see here that uh, I have done quite a bit of work uh, sonifying uh, EEG activity. Um, actually, um, all of that performance work is basically working, um, first of all, on this part of that loop. Um, uh, First of all, I'm going to um, answer Axel's question very quickly about the last slide. Um, so um, the spectrogram on the left you can see here is a recording of Alvin Berg's violin concerto. So this is a whole orchestra of sounds that are combined together. And we're looking at the um, time and frequency um, uh, spectral output of that recording. Uh, on the right here, um, this is uh, a very simple EEG uh, recording of somebody who is opening and closing their eyes. And, and so you can see, as, as we would expect there, um, the largest shift that we see um, because of uh, this person's actions is whether we see uh, a burst of alpha um, band activity. Um, uh, when they're closing their eyes, and then we see that activity um, going away when they open their eyes. Um, okay. Um, so uh, going back to this discussion, um, a lot of the um, performances, uh, including the example that I showed you, use a algorithm um, that I designed um, that was actually designed to um, bypass um, the the uh, stage that I mentioned before where we're trying to infer something about that person's state um, and actually directly sonify this, this sound, which means just taking that, that, that raw EEG data, turning that into sound um, and seeing if the properties of the resulting sound um, can tell us something about, um, about uh, that EEG data. Um, so uh, when I was uh, uh, describing this kind of performance activity to uh, some of uh, the doctors that I was uh, working with at the Dartmouth Hospital, um, they actually suggested that uh, this might be helpful in trying to diagnose different kinds of seizure activity. Um, and so you can see this is an example of one of the algor algorithms that I use uh, where I take our EEG data um, and uh, a bank of uh, pre-recorded sounds. Um, then I, you know, perform a Fourier transform on that data to um, figure out what the spectrum is, um, and then I, I multiply those two spectra together um, to get kind of a spectral mashing up um, between the EEG signal and that that um, sound signal. And then I can take an inverse FFT um, to then listen um, as a time series what um, that resulting spectrum would uh, sound like. Um, and then, you know, just for fun, you know, what, what I did is I performed some spatial filtering on that signal as well, um, so that, you know, depending on which part uh, of the 1020 uh, montage uh, that 
signal was recorded at, um, somebody listening to that sound would actually hear the sound coming from that direction. So if we were in like FZ, for instance, they would hear that, that sound kind of in front of their head uh, and right in the middle. If it was OZ, it would be in the back and so forth. Um, and so what we found um, was that uh, when we compared um, diagnosis from the um, visual signal uh, in doctors, um, what we found is that they were actually able to uh, identify different kinds of seizures um, just as well, if not uh, a better um, by uh, hearing that data as they were just by looking at the data. Um, so, uh, so this is just an example, uh, I think, of something that actually started out as a creative project, but then um, we were actually able to show that um, this was very interesting in the research uh, realm as well. So um, next I'm going to talk about uh, examples uh, um, that form part of this research, which is kind of seeing how we can um, compose music and um, engineer new kinds of sounds that are going to invite um, particular physiological responses, uh, in particular for people who might um, uh, be able to benefit uh, from these responses in some way. So in the same neurology group uh, that I mentioned before, uh, I collaborated with Dr. Barbara Yopes and Robert Kwan um, to prevent to present um, musical and auditory uh, stimuli that are uh, engin engineered to have um, very large amounts of e energy at uh, gamma rate um, uh, frequencies. Uh, and what we were basically trying to do is um, see if we can create a kind of uh, steady state auditory evoked potential that could maybe someday um, try to recreate some of the phenomenon that uh, Dr. Barbara Yopes was able to create using implanted uh, electrical brain stimulators. Um, and um, so for the past two years, we've presented research at the AES conference um, showing that we are able to create this kind of steady state auditory uh, evoked response um, using uh, musical sound. Um, so this is sound that I composed um, that, that on kind of manipulates um, lower frequencies. Um, and then uh, uh, subsequently we showed that we saw a uh, a reduction in interictal epileptiform activity um, after somebody heard these particular sounds. Um, so, so this is actually um, this is a vein of research that I am uh, also pursuing with a colleague um, that is uh, designed to investigate this. Um, uh, applied to Alzheimer's disease uh, as well. Um, so there might be some kind of beneficial effect to just being exposed to this kind of sensory stimulation, um, as has been showed in rodent uh, um, experiments so far, um, but uh, we are starting to work with human subjects as well. Are there any questions about this? Because I, I can go into a little bit more detail, but I'm giving a broad overview right now. OK. Um, so I'm going to move away from the brain work for just a second. Um, this is another vein of research that was inspired by the performance work that I was doing. Um, we were trying to see. Um, this is with the research group um, uh, that I worked with as a postdoc. Um, we wanted to see if being exposed to um, very soft uh, subliminal musical sounds um, that still imparted a kind of um, healthy breathing rhythm 
uh, might uh, invite people to slow their breathing down as well. Um, so we produced, um, let me see if I can actually play this sound for you. simple um, ambient uh, um, musical sound um, that uh, is still uh, designed um, to actually have uh, a very slow um, uh, breathing rhythm. Uh, and we know from prior research that uh, if somebody um, breathes at about six um, inhalations uh, per minute, um, that that is kind of a, a um, ideal rate uh, in order to, to um, have somebody uh, uh, be able to relax, um, be able to focus very well. Um, consequently, that's actually um, what I found with my performance work that um, I tend to settle in at uh, a similar rate. Um, so we produced um, this was actually a algorithmic music engine um, that was designed uh, just to produce this music on the fly. Um, and we had uh, people listen to this uh, as they were, um, as we were re recording their, uh, their EEG, their electrodermal activity, um, their breathing um, as well. Um, and we actually found that uh, even though we gave them another dual task uh, to do, and we actually did not tell them what the purpose uh, of this particular uh, experiment was, um, we actually found that everybody's breathing um, slowed down to match the music. Um, and in addition, um, we also saw these concomitant uh, changes in their other physiological measures as well. I'm sorry, I'm having um, some problem with these slides. Um, so we can see that their electrodermal activity dropped. Um, we were measuring the contingent negative variation as well. Um, and so we can see that, um, that the amplitude of that C and B dropped, which actually meant that they were um, uh, attributing more, more focus to to the task that they were doing um, uh, during this particular intervention as well. Um, and then we also saw um, their heart rate um, dropped as well during this. So I think that the real important takeaway here that, that we wanted to show, um, these different uh, colored bars are actually showing different types of intervention that will vary um, based on how personalized this is to the person. Um, and so this kind of fixed uh, tempo intervention um, would actually be the equivalent of just listening to a, a CD of um, uh, relaxing spa music, uh, for instance. Um, but we actually showed that um, creating this particular intervention um, personalized to that, um, that listeners um, baseline breathing rate uh, actually worked uh, a lot more. So, so this is kind of an argument that having these kinds of personalized technologies that are based on um, wearable data do actually work better um, than just uh, a one design fits all um, uh, technology. Um, and um, finally, I just wanted to show off um, some of my recently graduated PhD uh, students work. Um, his name is Mike Winters. Um, and Mike did uh, a study uh, trying to look at um, what happens when we're able to hear the heartbeats of others. Um, so I'm gonna just play these as an example for you. Um, and so for another um, chat window poll, um, I want you to tell me which of these people is more anxious than the other person, uh, or rather, which of these people is somebody that you would um, more likely want to have coffee with?
Okay, so this was uh, the person on the right that you're hearing. And this is the person on the left that you're hearing now. Okay, so for, for a quick um, poll, which of these, these people would you rather have coffee with? The person on the left or the person on the right? And you can enter um, your response into the chat window so I can see it, please. No responses? Were you guys able to hear the sound? Yeah, the person on, okay, right, left, right, left. Okay, so maybe some people, okay. Um, a, maybe a better question would be, um, maybe one of the people who said, right, why did you choose the person on the right? I'll play his sound again. And then one person said that he wasn't able to distinguish the rhythms. Um, maybe that was for the person on the left. So the left had a stronger beat. Yeah, so we have two examples here. These are just synthesized heartbeats, which is what um, Mike had developed for this experiment. Um, the idea was to create these kind of, uh, you know, synthesized um, virtual agents who had a particular uh, heartbeat um, that was designed to um, mimic um, what somebody would be feeling if they were uh, relaxed, if they were happy. Um, so oh, we, ha we have a couple more comments here. Um, so yeah, there were there were double beats when we played it on the left. Um, so what you were hearing there was an increased uh, heart rate variability, um, which is kind of uh, a marker, um, you know, sometimes of um, being in higher arousal. Um, you can um, you can see something like that um, in examples when somebody's uh, experiencing fear or uh, anxiety. Um, somebody said that the person on the right was calm and regular. Um, Michael says that he liked the simple beat on the right more, but he heard that the irregular beat on the left is more relaxed. Um, so I think the two parameters that we were changing here were um, mostly the, the tempo of the heartbeat and how um, a variable it was. Um, so has anybody seen uh, this particular photo before from an experiment? I'm sure um, given the audience of neuroscientists that we uh, have here that you guys have seen this before. Um, does this ring the bell, ring a bell for you guys? So this is uh, an example from the reading the, the eyes and the mind, or no, reading the mind and the eyes task. Um, and this is uh, a, a commonly used task um, that has been used to measure somebody's capacity for empathy. Um, more specifically, uh, what they call cognitive empathy, um, which is this ability to um, be able to give a name to what somebody else might be feeling. Um, you know, there's also what we call affective empathy, which is really uh, how much you are in turn feeling what you're perceiving in the other person as well. Um, so we have um, Divyansh. Um, actually uh, said what he thought this person was feeling. And he has a very good uh, uh, capacity for cognitive empathy because he was able to uh, identify that this actress was um, trying to impart a feeling of desire to us. Um, so um, because the human eyes are kind of the epicenter of this uh, emotional reaction or communication rather, um, we can very commonly identify what the emotion of somebody is uh, just by looking at the eyes. Um, and so what we wanted to do was kind of piggyback on the uh, uh, reproducibility of this test um, and you know, actually um, show if, if, um, if uh, playing heartbeats to people uh, as they are completing this task uh, will actually uh, change what their responses to this task was. Um, and in addition, um, we played just the heartbeats to people and wanted to see if their bodies uh, in turn change um, the way that 
their heartbeat um, is uh, um, what uh, speed it is working at um, uh, based on what they're listening to. Um, and uh, uh, also, um, if there's any correlation um, between um, what, uh, how well uh, they actually reported that they were feeling uh, the feeling of the person that they were hearing um, the the uh, heartbeat from, uh, and then uh, if that actually correlated with the way um, that their own heartbeat uh, matched the uh, heartbeat of the person that they were listening to. Um, so what we actually showed is that um, when somebody was actually in a more high empathy state, their their uh, heart rate, their heart rate did shift more, um, and so there was kind of this uh, connection there um, uh, between the uh, um, how much their own heart uh, kind of entrained to the heartbeat that they were listening to, and then how much they reported that they were feeling what that other person was feeling as well. Um, uh, interestingly, we were recording EEG at the same time. Um, there's this very interesting ERP called the heartbeat evoked potential. Um, and so this is a um, fluctuation in the EEG that we see um, in a person um, uh, based on uh, their perception of their own heartbeat. Um, so this does not include the cardiac artifact. Um, this is after that particular artifact is uh, taken away from that uh, EEG signal. Um, and this is actually um, used as an as a index of interoception, or basically um, how much somebody is uh, aware of their own internal bodily processes. Um, what we found actually uh, was that um, when somebody was in a, in a higher empathy state, um, we actually showed uh, a lower uh, HEP, uh, which told us that actually that person's attention to their own body um, was actually being drawn away from their, away from their own body and uh, onto the body of the person that they were listening to. Um, and so we were able to kind of make this connection um, between internal interoceptive processes um, and uh, attention to other people's uh, emotional state. Um, and that there's kind of a uh, conflict um, uh, between those two processes that you can see here. Um, so I think I'm pretty much out of time at this point. Um, and I wanted to um, leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so. Um, do we have uh, a list of questions now that I can uh, respond to? Maybe I can kind of uh, open up uh, the sounding board at this point. And I'm going to switch the audio back on so I can hear you guys. Hi. <laughs> I can hear you. Are you able to hear? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, yes, so we do have some questions already. Okay. Um, I'm just quickly going to bring Siobhan on screen as well, then we can start going through those. Thank you so much for your talk also, it was really, really interesting. Um, let me just see, there we go. Okay, so the first question we have on here mm -hmm. um, is from Bart, and he asked it at the start of your presentation, when we were still on the first slide with the spectrograms, I think. And he just wanted to know on which part of the cortex did you measure? Um, was it the temporal cortex? Oh, um, interesting. So are we, we're talking about uh, this slide right here, I'm assuming? I believe so. Maybe Bart can just give us an indication in the comments. So, um, so this is actually not my own data. But I would be 99% sure that this was uh, recorded from occipital cortex because um, that is normally where we would find this particular um, uh, visual, um, you know, shift in uh, visual cortex uh, activity um, due to the eyes being open and closed. 
Okay, perfect. Um, okay, let's see. So we have a question from Marco. Marco, can you maybe just give us an indication if you will be coming on screen to ask your question? Um, otherwise, Siobhan can maybe ask it on your behalf. Let's just give Marco a moment. And um, while we are waiting for Marco to respond, okay, no, he's he not able he's to come on screen. To. Yes. Can I maybe okay. just also get an indication, sorry, Siobhan, from everyone else, um, if they will be coming on screen for their questions or if Siobhan can just start asking on their behalf. Um, yeah, but in the meantime, Siobhan, go for it. <laughs> Great. Uh, so our question from Marco is what are your thoughts regarding Elon Musk's Neuralink and um, the implants uh, with specific regard to your research? Uh, are we able to use only electrobrain activity or do you think it's important to add other biometric inputs such as breathing or skin changes, etc.? Interesting. So um, I believe that this is referring to a recent uh, news item that they were planning to directly input um, music into the brain, like from somebody's iTunes playlist. Um, you know, interestingly, when I read that, I thought, how is this different than a cochlear implant, which basically does the same thing for people who are hard of hearing, that you're basically taking um, the, you know, auditory signal that you're measuring into uh, a microphone and then sending um, a voltage signal directly down auditory brainstem. Uh, to see if somebody, uh, you know, to kind of um, uh, reproduce uh, what the inner ear would be doing normally, which is kind of translating this acoustic signal into a electrical impulse that the brain can then uh, interpret. Um, so you guys probably read a little bit more about this than I did, um, but, you know, I'm kind of treating this like, you know, he's basically um, saying that he's going to create a next generation cochlear implant um, that is not just going to um, take a, a acoustic signal, but actually take something directly from a, a um, sound file. Um, I can say that there's a lot of limitations for cochlear implants um, because um, that, you know, they're only focused on kind of reproducing this very, very low level um, time series information um, there's a lot that is lost um, and, you know, we are able to interpret speech using a very, very, you know, um, low bit rate compressed signal. And we know that just by um, hearing speech over the telephone, uh, for instance. But the number one thing that the cochlear implant users complain about is um, how the music sounds so horrible. Um, and that's because, you know, really to, to capture um, a musical signal, we, we really need to have a much uh, larger bit rate. Um, there's uh, a lot more um, uh, uh, variation in the amplitude in there. Um, there's a lot more spectral information. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to hear about what they're working on, but I'm a little bit um, skeptical um, because uh, it would be something that would be pretty difficult to do. Um, but, you know, very interesting as well. Thanks. Um, great. I'm, I'm guessing Devyansh is not coming online. Um, so I want to combine his, he's actually got two questions that I think we can combine. Mm -hmm. um, his, the one question is just asking about EEG um, and mm -hmm. its inherently noisy nature. If you can maybe just uh, comment on your experience working with this type of noisy data and, um, actually like trying to find information amongst all the noise. And then um, on a similar vein, if you have any experience with epilepsy research um, mm -hmm. or if you can just any techniques, or any comments on, on that specifically um, I, I, the identifying the onset thereof. Seizure onsets, I'm assuming that. Yeah. That he's talking about. yeah. Okay, so um, I'll start with the first question, which is a really, really good question. Um, EEG is a notoriously awfully noisy signal. I know that like when I started doing this ECOG work uh, with the neurologists, I was like, 
you know, looking at this uh, electrocardiography, electrocardiography um, signal that is uh, recorded directly from the brain. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, perfect, perfect EEG. Um, because an actual EEG signal itself is recorded uh, over the hair, over the scalp, um, over the skull, over the uh, liquid that the brain is um, uh, floating in. And then uh, in addition, we can only get these very, very um, uh, small, weak signals when a whole population of uh, neurons will um, start to uh, fire uh, um, synchronously. Um, and so we can only really look at these very, very large epiphenomena in the brain um, of something, you know, sensory or cognitive that's very large that is going on. Um, and you can imagine that um, the types of experiments that I'm doing here when I'm looking at people that are listening to music, um, for my PhD work, I was looking at people who were moving to music, and you can imagine um, how ridiculously noisy that particular signal um, is. And um, I can say that the, the uh, answer that we had to that problem is not a simple one. We basically threw the entire grab bag of tricks that we have um, at that particular signal. Um, the first one being what people have been doing with ERP research from the very beginning, which is you record a lot of trials of exactly the same thing over and over and over again, and then you average that particular response. Um, and, you know, just by nature of um, what mathematically noise looks like um, in a normal distribution, you're going to have an equal amount of um, data that is above zero and an equal amount that is below zero. Um, and those are gonna be uh, randomly distributed. So when you record and, and average the same thing over and over and over again, all those plus ones are gonna cancel out all those minus ones um, and, and your noise is then going to be canceled into zero. Um, however, the one thing that's not gonna be canceled out through that averaging process is going to be um, that kind of overall um, smooth uh, fluctuation change in the ERP that you're actually wanting to measure. So only the thing that you are um, trying to look at that is in response to whatever kind of sensory or cognitive event that you're trying to track will actually show up. Um, so that is our kind of cheap and very powerful way that we deal with that particular noise process. And um, anything that I do involves some kind of protocol like that. Um, however, in addition, there are all kinds of um, statistical means that I uh, use um, that, you know, even after um, I have um, tried to denoise the signal um, using this kind of averaging process, um, I then look and see um, if there are any, uh, um, any channel data, any spectral data, um, any um, momentary uh, time chunks in that particular data um, that, you know, when I statistically plot these over a particular curve, do they have a, a particular um, kurtosis? Are, are they um, at the, the uh, extremes of this particular um, uh, uh, bell curve so that I can throw them out? Um, and so what I end up doing is throwing out a lot of data. Um, I remember for this one particular protocol where people were kind of expressively moving to music, out of 25 subjects, I probably kept 15 of those subjects. Um, there are very, you know, maybe 15% um, of the channels ended up getting thrown out, 15% of the time series data ended up getting thrown out. Um, there are um, some newer techniques that have been de um, developed uh, in my PhD lab since then. There's um, a implementation of artifact subspace reconstruction, um, which is something where you kind of perform a sliding window uh, PCA on that um, data uh, to try to see if there's any any um, specific components to that data that are going to stick out that you can then, um, you know, throw away. Um, and um, so I've actually been using that in a real time capacity for my performance work now, and that's been working very well. Um, because of course, when we're doing real time work, we can't do that same kind of averaging process. Um, so um, I have to, uh, again, use kind of a, um, a parallel 
uh, instantiation of a lot of these different kind of um, denoising techniques all at once. Um, and it and you know nothing looks very elegant, I would have to say. Um, okay, and then the other question was about uh, seizure de um, onset uh, detection. Um, the most interesting work that I found um, was with uh, was from um, uh, the professor that I did my postdoc with at MIT, uh, Rosalind Picard. Am I still sharing my screen? I think so. Yeah. Um, um, so she uh, formed the company that uh, created this particular uh, uh, device that you see here, uh, which is constantly uh, measuring electrodermal activity. Um, she actually, in her experiments, uh, records that uh, bilaterally on both wrists um, and has found with, uh, has found that she can actually um, very accurately predict seizure onset um, by using this, you know, pretty simple uh, um, wearable. Um, I think that, you know, seizure, seizure onset um, uh, can be detected within uh, EEG um, or ECOG. You know that's what these implantable neurostimulators do. Is they are constantly uh, recording ECOG, trying to identify a a, a pre seizure state and then produce um, like you know prophylactic um, uh, stimulation in order to try to interrupt um, the uh, oncoming seizure uh, that way. Um, so that can be done. I think, you know, to me, the interesting question is how can this be done in a more accessible way that does not require uh, open brain surgery? Um, and I think that this work that Empatica is doing using electrodermal activity is the most uh, exciting thing that I've seen in that direction. Great. Um, I'd just like to quickly uh, throw in a question of my own, just going back to the denoising um, of EEG data. Um, have you worked with uh, something like deep learning or machine learning for um, artifact detection? Um, I have seen a couple of algorithms around, um, but they're like reliance on very small data sets. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always wondering how effective they, they are. That's a good question. Um, so I can say that I personally have not. I'm a, you know, I'm pretty good at being an educated uh, consumer of these kinds of technologies, and I've definitely tried out a lot of the things that are available as um, tools in in uh, EEG Lab, uh, for instance. Um, the only um, machine learning approaches that that I personally have taken have been to um, try to uh, characterize or measure uh, internal state of somebody. So, you know, being able to um, give labels to somebody's musical experience, whether it's something that is uh, uh, relaxing or high engagement, uh, for instance. Um, but uh, there is, you know, a lot of interesting work that is being done for the artifact. Um, uh, work. Uh, in fact, uh, Zping Zheng's lab, I think, had this very amazing uh, demo video where they had somebody running on a treadmill um, and they were actually able to show the, the clean EEG output um, from that. So, Okay, great. Thanks. Um, next up, we have a, another question from Marco. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the capacity for this data to be used to enhance language between humans? And could this be used for greater precision with regards to truth and other emotions or thoughts? Wow, that's quite a philosophical question. Um, there's an impulse. OK, so I'll, I'll answer that from my perspective as a performer. So going back to, you know, this uh, this video here of me kind of playing on stage and I'll kind of pause that for a second. Um, I can say that from my perspective as a performer, I have this kind of this this training, especially as a flutist, to go on stage and to impart whatever emotion that the composer really intended at that time, right? So if uh, Mozart had intended, uh, you know, usually he's intending some kind of happy, joyful, jaunty 
you know, kind of classical dance, then I am going to impart that kind of uh, emotion on stage. Um, what I found with doing this kind of work where um, I'm putting these sensors on my body, um, that actually caused me to change what my approach was on stage, where now it's about really trying to experience something in particular and to impart that exact thing to the audience. And so there's no hiding what my actual internal state is. And in that way, this kind of music performance is a lot more truthful. Um, there was actually like one of the first more uh, high profile, uh, you know, high profile for me um, performances that I had given was something that was going to be streamed online just like this. There were like five different camera dollies and maybe like 10 people who were doing audio uh, and uh, um, video and filming work uh, of us when we were on stage. Uh, and, you know, I had spent the whole two weeks before training this particular um, detection, you know, algorithm to be able to classify how how relaxed and focused I was, I think. Um, and but I had done this in the lab, and then I went on stage, and everything just went completely haywire because I, you know, was experiencing stage fright for the first time since I was like 13 years old. Um, and so, like, my lips were trembling when I was playing flute, you know, just like they used to, and. Um, and so there was no, there was no hiding the fact that I was feeling really nervous, even though I had all this training designed to hide this, right? Um, so that was a real wake up call for me as well, because um, that actually changed the whole algorithmic approach that I took to this kind of performance. And I actually switched to that uh, sonification um, mode after that, because uh, I, I no longer felt that the right approach was for me to perform being relaxed or perform being calm or perform being focused on stage. I think the better approach was that I was going to much more truthfully and, and honestly just um, display what I was experiencing internally when I was on stage. And so that actually took a whole new algorithm that I you know, had to design in, in order to do that. So, you know, as far as language is concerned, I'm not a language expert. I am a music expert. Uh, music is a type of language. And I can say that I think that that this kind of technology is doing something that, you know, is related to truth in some ways on stage. So, Great. Um, I'm going to ask Deepak's question next. Um, I think there's a nice segue there. And he's asking about the importance of classical music in brain research. Oh, interesting. So um, classical music, so I can say that the music cognition community, this is like the academic community that, um, you know, most commonly studies how people perceive music, how people attend to it, their kind of emotional responses to it. They traditionally have been very focused on Western classical music. Um, and you know, there's a lot of reasons why I, th I think a lot of that involves just like the politics of academia and what kind of music that we deem to be important. Um, but that, of course, has changed over, you know, uh, in uh, recent years, um, you know, especially I think when um, as neuroscience has become more and more interested in things like affect um, and not focusing so much on things like attention and cognition the kinds of music that we are um, looking at has also expanded as well. Um, one thing at uh, Georgia Tech, um, we have this amazing uh, population of music technology grad students who are Indian classical music uh, performers. And so one of the things that I've been um, very excited to do is look at music affect, um, you know, in particular for Indian classical music, uh, which has a much more complex uh, approach to all of the different kinds of emotions and uh, feelings uh, that it is trying to impart. So instead of um, for uh, Western music, we basically have the major mode and the minor mode. And the major mode is sounds happy and the minor mode sounds unhappy. Um, whereas there's a whole um, kind of nested hierarchy of different kinds of emotional states in Indian classical music um, that the performer is, you know, trained to be able to 
improvise uh, to produce uh, and that are designed to be played at certain times of the day. Um, and, and you can imagine how as a stimulus you know, data set that that's a lot more uh, um, uh, rich to, to uh, study. And in addition, we can, we can try to look at and, and explain how much of this response is uh, culturally conditioned versus how much of that is innate as well. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, Axel is wondering about, um, or rather, do you have any idea about why the correlated area with the interoception of the heart beating was in the right hemisphere only? Um, referring to the captured EG in the last slide. So this is actually um, a slide that is not uh, updated here. And I think the answer is that I do not know about hemispheric, uh, you know, laterality of the heartbeat evoked potential. Um, so that is something that I would have to look up um, to answer this question. But I also know that this particular slide was something that my student had made um, before, um, before he had actually finished this particular study. Um, so I don't know the answer to this, but I, I can look that up uh, and, and answer offline if you'd like. Uh, so Bessie is asking, um, have you thought of using, oh, sorry, it's jumping around a bit. How do you separate a basic physiological response to music and an individual learned response to certain sounds? For example, the relaxed breathing music sounded to me like trucks or traffic on a highway, um, making her feel panicky rather than relaxed. Yeah, so, um, you know, as, as uh, scientists, we are mostly interested in looking at what the least common denominator is across a whole population of people. And that if we can only, it, it's only uh, kind of interesting to us if we can show a similar response across a lot of people. That to us as scientists means that there's some uh, true response there. But I agree that a lot of this work is incredibly individualized. Um, that's kind of why I joked at the beginning when I showed that film of me performing that I like to approach that as a kind of N equals one experiment because I do like to acknowledge that a lot of these responses are very individualized. Unfortunately, we don't have um, great scientific approaches right now to looking at individual responses. Um, so um, in the epilepsy work that I'm doing, um, because every patient is so different, we actually look at um, within subject responses exclusively almost. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you're working with uh, implanted uh, sensors, um, the way that those sensors are implanted in every person has to do with how you're they're trying to um, track down uh, their particular seizure uh, um, foci. Um, and so everybody has a very different uh, sensor montage. Um, and so um, we have a very heterogeneous data set and we can only really look at what happens within every person. Um, but the exact kind of um, uh, thing that she is trying to mention is actually something that I would like to work on more with our um, healthy subjects is trying to find more um, kind of scientifically uh, cogent ways of trying to track down what happens in individuals when they look, when they listen uh, to music. Um, one example of a really great study with that was something that uh, Valerie Salmonpour did looking at uh, dopamine responses to um, um, music that every person individually chose as something that creates um, very pleasurable responses for them. And so that was a way that we, they had a very heterogeneous stimulus set, but a very homogeneous effect that they were trying to, um, to seek there. So I, I hope that uh, answers the question a little bit. Thanks. Great. Uh, Dave, before you ask your question, uh, would you mind just giving us a brief introduction? Um, so it's your second time on screen and we actually have no idea 
who you are. So um, yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, hi, hi guys, and I'm um, Grace. Um, I'm a, a teacher, online teacher in the current day and age, um, and um, I'm just really interested in a lot of the things that you're talking about, philosophy as well. So that philosophical question that came up earlier um, resonated with me, and um, actually, it came. The, the question that I thought of came up when you were describing how. What, what, you, what is going through your mind as you try to play or evoke what a composer has written down? Like, you, you, you seem to characterize a piece of music in the same way that I think of it, which is a little bit different from most people, as in, like, it's emotions on paper. Um, and, um, but it's also, I'm not sure if it conflicts with what you just talked about now, how some, you have a, there, the, like the minor and major thing is supposed to have like a homogeneous, I think, effect on us. Mm. Uh, that's what I think anyway. But is it a Western thing um, that we've been trained to, or do these does this combination of frequencies have some inherent sort of basis for why it, it causes a pleasant or negative feeling in humans? Um, yeah. Is it widespread or is, yeah, can you explain why it is that there is this strong connection? Sure. Um, so there, there's a whole spectrum of explanations and reasons why from, from one end of that being your, your individual hair cells along the basilar membrane, when two of them um, uh, fire and they're too close together that that actually creates this feeling in us that's kind of uncomfortable so when you play two piano keys together uh, that are very close together on the piano you actually hear this interference between that 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 signal and we are we are primed to um, hear that as being a very dissonant sound and we're primed for a dissonant sound to feel very uncomfortable for us and one possible explanation for that is that when you're in um, the forest, you know, like we would have been, you know, 15,000 years ago, um, we are kind of primed to hear sounds that um, have a kind of, um, uh, you know, harmonic structure where with these very evenly spaced uh, uh, harmonics, um, those sound a lot more uh, pleasant to us, and those are what we are primed to be able to appreciate. Um, right. now, okay. In this day and age, when we have electronic sounds, um, you know, we can, we can produce, you know, like uh, what I do in my research, where I have uh, a sinusoid at, at 40 hertz and a sinusoid at 40.25 hertz, and it creates this 0.25 hertz uh, signal that we can hear. Um, you know, we have a lot of mathematical control over those sounds and we can create these very unnatural things that still sound very unpleasant to us. So that's, uh, that's the kind of most probably low level physiological uh, explanation that some people have used to explain why some music is pleasant and why some music is not. Mm. And then on the other end, you know, of that whole spectrum, you have, you know, simply, you um, people who associate pleasant music with happy times in their lives and people who associate sad music with sad times in their lives. It's very like conditioned uh, and culturated response um, that we have. I think I actually have a neat slide that I can show you guys, but it's kind of um, in the trash heap slide section here, um, which I don't know if you can see my, um, my screen right now. Can I do the screen sharing um, again? Uh, yeah, I'll quickly close my video, then you can do that. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to share I... now. Okay, I'm gonna select that, because I think that this is actually a really good uh, answer to your question. It's the most, but I can't mm -hmm. find, I can't find the settings now to share this, unfortunately. Because it, it, it sounds you... kind of analogous to the same way in like, um there seems to be a similar sort of mechanism in our bodies that um, rewards us for doing physical labor, like hiking up a mountain why, or running for a long time. Why do we have endorphins? Like, is our body priming us for something? And it, again, it, it makes sense. Like if you're living in the savanna or something, um, going out and hunting, you should uh, be incentivized to do this. It should be a, a pleasant thing with the rewards so that you will actually go and do it. 
I get the food for yourself and struggle, take on the challenges and whatever. Um, right. is, is, would you say like, yeah, so like the, the we, we hear a certain kind of sound because that kind of sound is probably going to be uh, having good things at the end of it or something. Ah, yeah, okay. there there are a lot of uh, rewarding uh, aspects of music. Um, I can't share the list with you here, but um, actually I could probably, well, no, I won't try to copy and paste that into the chat. Um, but, you know, currently there's one researcher who tracked down nine routes to induced emotion in music listening. Um, and one of those things has to do with, um, you know, whether somebody is trying to anticipate some kind of event and whether that anticipation ends up uh, um, <laughs> uh, being fulfilled or not. And, and that's something where you can actually see those uh, uh, reward um, structures in the brain light up when somebody's attention has been primed for some kind of event to happen and then that actually happens, right? Um, we also have um, simple uh, um, brainstem uh, um, uh, reflexes that uh, will happen. Um, so that happens when um, somebody hears like a very startling loud sound and our body is then primed to want to run away. Um, but there's a lot of kind of like electronic music, for instance, mm. and dance music that actually operates on that particular principle where they're trying to um, kind of operate on this um, very uh, low level fundamental need that our body has to, uh, to um, uh, you know, move when we hear something. Um, right. There's also uh, research that has shown that there's kind of an internal way that we entrain to particular rhythms. Um, there's kind of a social cohesion uh, function in that. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you imagine a, a whole bunch of animals that are um, uh, running along the savanna together, an important part of being able to run together as a group is hearing other people's footsteps. Um, and so there are some people who have shown that um, or, you know, hypothesized that a lot of what we do in um, uh, uh, drum circles, for instance, uh, is this way of um, trying to uh, create uh, social cohesion and cooperation in that way. And that has a very intrinsically, um, you know, pleasant feeling association for, with it. For social um, animal like us. Yeah. Right. So, that, you know, exactly. So there are as many explanations for this kind of question as there are uh, topics that social neuroscientists and affective neuroscientists study, I think. Um, but, yeah, but I think there are real reasons. For that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of think of, uh, okay, so I to get really philosophical and also combining with music. Um, I think of logic as being a real thing that exists. It's a natural, intangible thing. Um, it exists, there are rules to it. And when you have a bunch of people um, talking, the ones who are following logic seem to be the ones who can coordinate. And it's like a pleasant thing. So being able to, to get uh, catch the beat in rhythm, because there is a logic to the song, like, although you don't know what's coming next, you can't know based on what you've seen before, logically, there's going to be this thing. And when it is that thing, ah, yes, we, we all anticipated correctly our logic works. And it's it's almost like physical logic. It, it, yeah, it's, it seems like a, a beautiful sort of parallel, I think, on many levels. It's, it's like a flow state, you know, flow state. Right, well. you know, like there is a lot of internal logic um, that is produced by in a musical communication that internal logic is all that we have because we're not mm. this is a uh, language that is not a referential thing so it's like you know all it has to operate on is the kind of internal logic that is expressed through the music itself that is something yeah. that we're kind of all agreeing on how that logic works yeah yeah it's, it's a like a really good point hmm. it seems like lang language is a, another method of communication but it's it's not as universal as rhythm or music, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but also, yeah, um, yeah, so music, well, yeah, 
Yeah, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Ring and answering and asking, opening up a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Yes, thank you very much, ladies. Thanks. Hey. Um, yeah, thanks for coming online. It's um, always exciting to not have me talking the entire time. Um, <laughs> I think for our last question, I hope it's not an unfair representation, but I am going to try combine two. Um, and it's about influencing emotion or um, affecting empathy um, with music, um, especially um, yeah, if this can be found in the EEG specifically. Um, the effects of music on empathy and or emotion. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's there's quite a bit of emotion research that has done has been done with EEG. Um, that is not to say that EEG is the best signal to look at when we're looking at emotional processes. Um, you know, emotion uh, going back to the James Lange, you know, theory we kind of um, don't have a solid answer to whether emotion is created in the body first or uh, and then is thus created from our own cognital, cognitive appraisal of how our body is responding to something uh, or whether it is uh, created first through our mind uh, uh, trying to recognize something and then our body, um, uh, you know, then in turn, uh, uh, you know, changing our our or our heart heart rate, our um, uh, skin conductance. Um, so you know, naturally, when you are looking at at uh, EEG, you are looking at this extremely high level uh, epiphenomenal uh, trace of some kind of experience that somebody is having. That is naturally a cognitive thing because you are looking at at cortex, um, and you can see you know, traces of amygdala response and things like that, that, that might be uh, projected onto cortex. But in reality, there's a lot of emotion researchers who believe that um, looking at those more primal um, um, body responses is really a, a much better way to go um, because you can, you can see how somebody's emotional response um, tracks with their their heartbeat, their skin conductance level, um, their breathing, um, you know, those things in turn, you can, um, you can see how the brain uh, appraises that. So we can, you know, there's uh, a very classic uh, kind of results that a, a lot of uh, affective brain computer interface uh, systems use that there's a, a interhemispheric uh, alpha activity um, where the uh, when you see greater frontal alpha activity in the left uh, hemisphere that is associated with more positive emotions and um, the right hemisphere is more uh, um, negative emotions so things like sadness or or fear um, but you know then again you kind of from an engineering standpoint that makes a lot of sense if you run a big study um, with hundreds and thousands of people and you kind of notice that you have this result that is uh, a byproduct of some kind of stimulus that you're doing. If you're only wanting to be able to identify which of your film samples that you're showing are producing more positive emotions and which of your film samples are producing uh, um, less positive ones, then that is a good way to be able to do that. You can take a machine learning um, uh, uh, approach to that where you have a very clear uh, stimulus set and then you can see um, which category your new data is going to end up in. Um, however, if, if, uh, if you're wanting to take a more scientific approach, if you're wanting to really examine what the mechanisms are um, behind how a particular emotion response uh, is going to be created, you know, let's say in a piece of music, um, again, we have these kind of nine explanations for how that particular emotion um, might be created. And some of those explanations are better to track in the brain and then others might not be. 
Um, and so that really depends on what exact question that you are trying to answer when it comes to, to uh, affect. Is it the kind of aesthetic um, uh, judgment of that particular response or um, the visual imagery that is produced when somebody hears that particular sound? Um, or is it um, the um, uh, rhythmic entrainment to the sound? Um, so all of those questions are going to have different kinds of data that, that you're going to want to analyze to answer um, that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that, that concludes our discussion. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Julianne. I think Julianne's on mute. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so we please just want everyone to give Dr. Leslie a virtual round of applause in the comment section for this really, really cool presentation. Um, and thank you so much again, Dr. Leslie, for coming online and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank and you. This was so much for... fun. It's like such a special experience to meet so many people from around the world. And I think what you guys are doing is very cool. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and then also we want to thank all of you in attendance. Um, yeah, it's great to see everyone here again. And then lastly, I don't know um, if the link at the bottom of the screen is visible and working now, but you should be able to follow a link to subscribe to NERV's event calendar. So hopefully that is working. Um, yeah, and like Siobhan said in the comments, that's an easy way for you guys to just get early access to our upcoming events and so on. And then lastly, we also want to thank our sponsors, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedical Engineering Research Group at Stellenbosch University. And hopefully we will see you all again online for our next event on the 26th of August. And that is everything from my side. Thank you and good night.